Welcome to everybody that's just coming in and joining us. Thanks for coming in and being here live with us on Zoom. I'm so excited to welcome my guest, Patty Lyons, today. Patty, as you probably all know, is a fantastic knitting designer, knitting instructor, and technique expert. Welcome, Patty. Thanks. You want? To, can we do, do the um, uh, side by side thing? Can you hit me with the? Uh, I sure can. Yeah, that, that way, when we talk together. It's not like boom, 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 but we're just side by side. I can do that. There we are. Ah, there we go. Now we can like interrupt each other and, and the, <laughs> our pictures don't disappear. I always prefer the side by side for that very reason. Yeah. We'll still, I think, appear and disappear on you on YouTube on the video, but. Uh, oh, no, no, we, we're, you, you stay side by side. Great. Awesome. Uh, thanks, everybody joining us here live today. I want to just invite you all to put any questions you have in the chat. And if you put a big Q in front of that, that's super helpful. We are going to save the last little bit of this time together to answer all of your questions, which I'm very excited to do. So go ahead and put them in the chat as they come to you. Oh, I see so many familiar faces. Ah, look at all this. I, I got a lot of my regular people here. Hi, Corey's here. Hello. Awesome. Natalie's here. Oh my goodness. My, oh, this is so good. Sorry. All right. This I'll is so much fun. I'll I love I, getting distracted by looking at the people. I, I know. Isn't it awesome though? We get to see everybody on their videos. Thanks everybody for having your videos on. So Patty, you have been really busy this year. Among many other things, I know that you launched a whole new learning platform. Tell us about that. Oh my God, was that just this year? I think. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I have no sense of what year it is. The other, <laughs> yesterday morning, I was talking out with a friend and I clicked the button on the upper right hand corner of um, my laptop to see what year it was. So, <laughs> yeah, did I launch it this year? Let me see. What was my first class? Uh, 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 I guess Gramercy Park was my first class. So I guess that was this year. Oh my God. Um, yeah, so that was kind of crazy timing because I thought um, I would have like a lot of time to get it set up because I had planned it. Um, this was all pre-COVID. This was like a long journey to launch the education platform. Um, and... I had scheduled time between my travels, you know, to get this set up. And then COVID happened. Now you might think like, oh, well now you're home. You, all your jobs are being canceled. That is true. I had, uh, 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 there were, I don't know, like 18 trips canceled. But then as you know, the virtual teaching started um, and it got even busier. So. Um, that all went a little crazy. So it was a bit of a learning curve. So what I didn't get to do with Gramercy was uh, launch it with some test students. Well, actually I did. I, I launched it with some test students. I had some lovely people that um, tested some like mock classes and we tested the functionality and they helped me so much because they found like a million, gajillion things. Every time you think like you've thought of every scenario, um, first I gave it to my IT friend and I said, um, break my site. Cause that's what you do when you have someone test a site. I'm like, break my site. She's like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm going to break your site. Um, so she found a bunch of things. Then the testers found a million things. And then I launched it with Gramercy park. Um, and then I started teaching live on it, which was great. Um, cause it's a great, it's a great place to have live teaching to be all on the education platform, because unlike just like sending someone a Zoom link, you go onto your class dashboard, there's your handout, there's any like exercises there, there's any pre-questions, um, then you do the live event, then the follow-up recording is there, and then um, they join the community group and, and share their progress. So um, yeah, it's been great. It's been quite, quite a journey though. <laughs> That is a really robust platform. It, it, it was a lot of work. We're still, we're still uh, changing. So like I, 
one of the one of the big things that changed <clears throat> after Gramercy that you know again you think you think of everything was the community aspect. Um, there were two things kind of really wrong <laughs> with the community group that um, bummed people out that are used to message boards on Ravelry. Here I thought like, oh, it's going to be so much more robust than Ravelry because um, I don't know if you if you have a group on Ravelry, but people are always like struggling to post pictures and why is my picture posted side, sideways and like, you know, so this was like super user friendly to post pictures, to share. But what I didn't realize is it wasn't threaded. So you posted a comment, like you posted a post like, oh, here's my sweater in progress. And then everyone can comment like, oh, it's so beautiful. It looks great. But then if Patty posts something and Mary says, oh, what color is that? Patty can't re reply just to Mary. It's all like, so anyway, that got fixed. So now the community groups are much better and they have spaces, which are like individual rooms, um, kind of like the, the different boards on Ravelry. So like for, you know, charade, there'll be um, yarn choices engage space and, you know, life as I knit, um, which was sad because someone posted a picture of their broken arm is their picture from life as I knit, <laughs> um, you know, in, in progress and prize thread and all that stuff. So yeah, we're still, it's always, it's ever evolving. That's awesome. And you just recently launched your latest video sweater class to that platform, oh, yeah. right? Charade Brioche. This one and this one. Mm -hmm. This is my winter version because it's cold. What's the difference between them? Well, th this one's a, a, a lot of different things. Well, first of all, they're two different yarns. So I, I kind of got into that. Um, trying to remember how I fell into that. I think, oh, I remember the first time I did that was for Tortola. And it was because whatever video sweater class came before that uh, only, came, you know, like most people, I knit the sweater out of one yarn. And so then some people that were allergic to animal fiber were saying, oh, is there any, you know, non-animal fiber alternative? So for Tortola, I was like, oh, I'm going to knit it out of two different yarns an animal fiber and a non-animal fiber that work. And then I just like went down that rabbit hole, like Gramercy Park had four different yarn options. So I just, I just keep going insane. So what I'm wearing is Whistler and that's a, a lovely winter yarn. That's a Taki yarn and it's, um, it's a wool and alpaca, no, not alpaca. It's a wool and mohair blend, which is so, so nice. And um, this is Holly which I totally love. It's cotton, silk, and nylon. Hmm. So this was sort of my, you know, sp spring, fall transitional garment. But the other thing is this, cause I love doing options. <laughs> this is the pattern as written. So you can take the video sweater class in one of the 10 sizes that it comes in, but you can also get the customization bundle where you get this, and all the videos in the customization unit and this like crazy giant spreadsheet where you put in like your gauge and I want, um, I'd like long sleeves and I'd like the wrist measurement to be this and, you know, and I'd like in between size this and this and oh, I think I wanna do a big wide turtleneck and it kicks you out a custom pattern. So this is all customized. This one's between size, that one's size two. This one's between size two and three. Um, Cause we're all friends here, right? It's just us. This isn't like, <laughs> oh, this isn't like live on YouTube, right? This is just us. So Absolutely. in, in winter, um, there's a little, there's a little uh, hibernation layer that I often have on my body. <laughs> So I like my winter sweaters to be a little larger. There you go. So this is between a size two and three. And then I had like more waist shaping in the back than the front. Cause again, hibernation labor, lip, you know. Or just if you need to layer, right? To, to be warmer. I, I am, and I am, I'm like way layered today. I have, <laughs> I have many layers on today. Yeah. Awesome. So, awesome. Anyway. so what prompted you to create a brioche pattern for this one? 
Um, you know, <laughs> uh, well, I was, I did this hat, which I really liked. And I really like, you know, sometimes when you invent a stitch pattern, it takes you a really long time to create the stitch pattern. And um, uh, then you're like, I, I, I want to use that again. And I got that vibe from my friend, Laura Nelkin, who um, is the queen of that. So I, the first time she did it was artichoke French. She, she, she made this stitch pattern she liked. And, and I, I think they were mittens first, but I'm not totally sure. And then she's like, I really like the stitch pattern. Now it's going to be a hoodie. Now it's going to be a this. Now it's a... So anyway, I thought, oh, I really like that. <laughs> and I think it would look really nice, like in a trim. Um, but the hat is rib. And it just was not transitioning into stockinette. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, Rio stockinette. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, but also with with the video sweater classes, each one, I, I, I some some of the knitters have been with me for I think I'm on my 12th or 13th video sweater class. Um, and there have been knitters that have been with me th through all of it. So I got to like. I got to keep I got to bring it, man. I got to keep coming up with new stuff. Cause they're not, my, my knit alongs are not like row one, we do this row two. We, you know, they're like big major teaching things. So, you know, people have been on me about teaching brioche for years, but I've always said uh, people have been on me about teaching double knitting and brioche for years. And I'm not one of those teachers that like takes somebody else's class once kind of memorizes it and then goes, okay, I'll teach it. Because what happens when you do that, when you just learn a thing just to teach it, is then the knitters will ask you a question and you're like, oh, uh, well, on row two, we do, you know, <laughs> like, so until you're kind of an, an expert enough that you've done a deep enough dive that you've like totally dissected it, screwed it up on purpose tried to figure out how to build it better, all that stuff, then, then I, I haven't wanted to teach it. So I took a long time to make sure that, you know, I had my own take on brioche, my own way to explain it, my own, um, my own decreases, which I think is so funny because what I've realized lately is no two designers do their decreases the same. I think that's really interesting. Like I, I knew that me and Bristol did them differently and I knew that me and Zandy did them differently. And then I just checked out how Michelle did. I'm like, well, yep, there's yet a fourth way. It's, <laughs> it's wild. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And you go, I mean, if you go in and you look at even, you know, some of the books that are written out that are out there on brioche and there's not, you know, as much on brioche as there are in some other techniques, but right. I still like, oh, that's not how I do that. That's really different. Right. And so I started with Nancy because she is our queen, right? So you start, anyone that wants to really learn and explore brioche and doesn't start with Nancy Marchand, no, that's, that's our foundation. That's our, she was the giver. She was the, she is our queen. She's called the brioche queen for a reason. Um, and I, I like the way her decreases look in some stitch patterns, mm. but I didn't dig them in the stock in it. I liked it totally um, un unwrapped and unraveled. And then some people's unwrapped are like just way too complicated for me. I would never be able to remember them and I'm too lazy. So everything about the way I develop tricks is that laziness is the mother of invention. I absolutely hear you. So, you know. If I, if I can't remember it, if it doesn't like make sense, like, oh, right. That's very similar conceptually to the SSK. Oh, right. That's very, you know, then I'm never going to, it's, you know, yeah. I'm not going to remember it. And I know this video platform is not the only thing you've been up to this year. You are writing a book, right? I am. Yes. I'm very close to the deadline. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's been an intense time. So unfortunately thanksgiving is coming sort of like right in the deadline but um yeah so it, it if i'm on time um 
oh my God, my brother and sister are texting like crazy. I have to close this laptop. I, <laughs> I, I see them out of the corner of my eye popping up because I turned off notifications over here. We're doing vac- uh, Thanksgiving planning. Um, so yeah, December 18th, I got to turn that bad boy in. So I'm, I'm trying very hard not to be the only author in the world to not cry uncle and ask for more time. And I know, like, I know for a fact that most deadlines are fake deadlines and that have air, but I'm like, I'm going to do it on time. So So what's the book going to be like? uh, Well, I'm not sure how much I should talk about it before it's published, but it's, it's, um, it's uh, all, you know, it's stuff out of my brain. It's ways to do things better. Nice. It's all thing, ways to ignore the rules. So it's the thing that people have been bugging me, asking me to do for years. And um, again, I'm lazy. So I've never particularly wanted to write a book. So there's some people that dig video classes, but then there's always the people that are like, oh, but is this written in a book? You know, and I get asked that all the time with Modern Daily Knitting, the column that I write for MDK, like, oh, I wish these were all in a book. Um, So anyway, I've never really wanted to write a book. So I've never done a book proposal or shopped it around. Um, But a publisher just came, my wonderful publishers came came knocking and then they just would not take no for an answer. So then uh, apparently I'm writing a book. (laughs) Do we have any idea when we might get to see that on the shelves? Fall of uh, fall of 2022. Yeah. So uh, about a little under a year from now, if, 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 if supply chain holds, because actually there is a problem with paper availability, I'm understanding with new books. I've heard that. Yes. Uh, Yes. Google paper. And um, yeah, it's, it's actually going to be really rough on local yarn stores because for all of you lovely folks that are out there listening in radio land, this is the story that I just heard on NPR. What I talked about is that even even if people want to buy a book from their their local store and they're like, I'm not going to do, you know, big chain, Barnes and Noble, Amazon. I want my local store. Um, Order it now (laughs) because it's take a long time to get it. But also that it's going to be hard for the smaller stores because um, the publishers are going to prioritize the big giant orders. So yeah, so supply chain fun. So if supply chain doesn't interrupt, it should, it's theoretically September, 2022. That sounds very exciting. I'll look forward to that. And I um, I guess in the meantime, maybe we'll just all have to discover some, uh, some books, some treasures that are already on the shelves in the bookstore or something. <laughs> we'll have to be creative this holiday season, right? Well, and I just did, I did a two-part holiday gift blog, so. Um, you can find some some gift ideas for your fellow knitters or yourselves, bags and things. Um, oh, I hope you discuss mapping your sweater, <laughs> says Judy. Do you mean in class or now? <laughs> Maybe she means in the book. Oh, oh, you know what? That was in there and I cut it. <gasps> I cut it because I cut it out of the book because I actually think it belongs in a different book the sweater mapping. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was originally in chapter three and it got cut. I cut it. I mean, the publishers didn't, but I, I felt like it was really, um, another topic. That is really interesting. Pat. So how do you decide of the, of the universe of knitting information out there? How do you decide how to organize a certain amount of it into a book length book? Well, I mean, first of all, it's not one thing that makes it easier is it's not all the the tricks in the in the universe. So they're they're my tricks. So one thing I try to do is if if this is not unique, if this is not my invention, if this is not something that's different, um, you know, it's not discussing how to cast on, how to do the knit stitch, how to, you know how to do magic loop, how to avoid ladders. and Like it's not, it's none of that. So um, I'm used to structuring things just from the video classes that I built. So it was not that dissimilar to structuring the the classes that either I've, you know, produced myself or for Annie's or Craftsy or Interweave. Um, 
So the first thing is getting your outline done. And the first thing I do is I vomit every single topic, not into a Word document, but into Excel, because it's easy to then move it around. And then I, and then I look at the topics and then I, I take another column and I sort of uh, write like groupings, like, oh, I think um, this is part of a, you know, part of a this topic. So you try to think of the macro topic. Then you sort of step back and go, okay, so then this, 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 and this, okay, because that'll be in this section. And, oh, that leads to this. And even then, um, there's rearranging. Like I just uh, completely rearranged a whole section of the book where like you write, write, and then you're like, you know what, that should have come earlier, or that actually should come in chapter three. So they're still like playing around and <laughs> Natalie, when will your second book come out? Natalie, <laughs> let me write the first one. And yes, I'm, um, Ellie, I'm very much hoping to uh, get a book signing at, at Rhinebeck. That is for sure, for sure, for sure up there. If all goes well, that would be what I want to do. So Patty, speaking of Rhinebeck, I had a fantastic time getting to meet you in person in Rhinebeck. Um, that was super, super great. And that was- You haven't met me in person. I mean, I, you know, I said that wrong. Can I, can I like rewind? <laughs> yes, I, you can. I mean, it was so great to see you in yeah. person at Rhinebeck after that was yeah. you know, after so long, everything being virtual. It was so great to see anyone in person, yeah. wasn't it? Like all the, all our, our peeps. Yes, it really was. It was amazing. Um, but you have been so on it virtually from the beginning of when everything shut down, it seemed like you were one of the first knitting instructors that pivoted and that you pivoted really fast. Well, because I have been doing it for years. Yeah. So that, that's what a lot of people didn't know <laughs> is that I have been teaching virtually for, for years. I used to teach on a platform called Take Lessons where I had my own, uh, my own, teaching platform that, I mean, that wasn't mine, that I didn't build myself. It was, I, I just had, I, I taught on a existing teaching platform. So yeah, I had been doing it for years, not on Zoom, on a different platform. Um, like I, and I've gone through so many, like Take Lessons originally used Google Hangout. Do you remember Google Hangout? Oh my <laughs> God, it was like tragic. Um, and then they finally had their own platform that they incorporated built in. Um, but, you know, as far as like the lights and the camera and, and camera switching and being used to like, you know, talking here while I'm looking here, while I'm reading chat like that, uh, it's just, I've been doing that for a really long time. So it was easy. It was an, <laughs> it was an easy pivot because it wasn't so pivoty. So do you think that's going to be, or if, when we can be in person again. And I don't know if you've done how much you've done in person at this point. Um, I'm outside. Of, oh, you mean in my life or this year? Well, I like, you know, again, like this year, 2021, now that some of us are doing some things in person again. The the first in person thing I did was Rhinebeck. And then um, starting in February, I'm on the road again. Yeah. So I, I have affinity, right? Oh, yes. Oh, God. <laughs> Just the one thing you know that, you, that you put together and ran yourself. I was thinking about, you know, getting on a plane and going to teach for other people. But yes, that was my, yes. What are the odds that your first retreat happens to be during a, a global pandemic? So then the, the thing I will say that I was the first to pivot on was a virtual retreat. So Affinity, September of 2000. 20 mm -hmm. that I had to figure out from scratch. Like no one was, no one had done that type of event yet. That was crazy pants. How early, how far in advance of that did you have to make those decisions? Uh, it was rough because um, if we think back, I know it seems a long time ago, but think back to what life was like in April and May of 2022. Think about March. When everything when everything I was signed up for was getting pushed to September. Yeah, think about March of 2022, and when like the New York New York was shut down for four weeks. 
And we all turned to each other and, and like Broadway was shut down and that was going to be tragic. Like, oh my God, four weeks. How, how will we ever, I still say we after all these years, how will they ever recover? Um, the, the longest time Broadway had ever been shut down um, was back when I was still a stage manager was 9-11. That was two, two days. Wow. And then we, 42nd Street, which was the show that I was on at the time, we kind of were one of the shows that made history because we shut down three times, 9-11, the blackout of uh, 2002, and the musician strike. So, you know, when we shut down for four weeks, people were like, oh, it's not going to be four weeks. I, I, I will lay money. It's going to be like six or eight weeks, mm-hmm. right? So if you think back to March, well, I'm not canceling a retreat in September. So also, you need the resort to consent to transfer your... Uh, deposits and everything to the next year. So um, in, I think it was in May, I put a survey out to everyone that had registered to just get a sense. I wanted to get a sense of um, would people be willing to come if they had to be masked the entire time? Because back then, like we thought that was, you know, like, oh, maybe we'll be able to do it in September. But by June, it became really clear that it wasn't going to happen. But I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to make plans for a live event and a virtual event at the same time. So really the entire virtual event got created between, including figuring out how to open up registration. And that was like, uh, you know, cause people had to be able to register and then log in through their portal and like, you know, all that. And the company that was the registration company for my live event, they pivoted to virtual and they weren't really ready. Mm. So there, it was a really buggy. There were like a lot of issues. Um, yeah, so I, so I put that together just in, in, um, in three months and we had, we had uh, five vendors in a virtual marketplace. We had um, four teachers and a speaker, um, had f- six Zoom rooms going at once, four assistants, it was, it was madness. So was madness. which which is more work in person or virtual? You know, in, in a lot of ways, virtual, because you can't just walk in the room and check in on your people. But um, the resort did an amazing job. But because of COVID, they were at about 50% capacity for the staff. Mm-hmm. So there were definitely, I mean, the, the attendees were so nice. Everyone said like, why well, we didn't feel any, we didn't notice any balls drop, but to, for me, I was like, oh, 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 you know, like catching them as fast as I can. But, um, everyone was amazing. Everyone was so, uh, kind and cooperative and so willing to take all the safety precautions. No one, no one said boo when I, required vaccination. And this was really early on, like no one was requiring vaccination yet. It was like a totally, it was a scary thing to send that email. Cause I thought, I and, and now it's, you know, it's the norm, but like, but yeah, so I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> so other than affinity and Ryan Beck, I won't really hit the road again until February. So that's when the live events start to kick up again. A lot of them were events that I still owe from mm. 2020. I still, I will still be paying back jobs that got canceled into 2023. Cause like I have a, I have a gig with Lucy Neatby in Canada that got canceled in 2020 and it could not be rescheduled for 2021 because high borders weren't open yet. So they, they did the event with Kate Atherley and Fiona Ellis, two Canadian teachers. And then Lucy and I'll do it next year. Yeah. So back when all that happened, I'm thinking back to March 2020 and April 2020, and you put Quarantine Live out there. Oh, yeah. When you started doing right, you started doing your weekly your weekly YouTube live. And I have to wonder how back then, how long did you think that all of that was going to be happening? Six weeks. <laughs> I thought I thought six or eight weeks. So what happened was I used to do a FaceTime, uh, uh, FaceTime. <laughs> I used to do, what's the name of the website Facebook? that we all hate now? Facebook. Thank you. I'm like, I couldn't remember the name. Uh, I used to do Facebook Live and I did it once a month. And um, 
things were just beginning to kind of the backlash was just beginning to happen where people were like, I want to get off Facebook. Um, and you, I can't attend your live. Can you do it on YouTube? Cause of course, YouTube, you do not have to have an account. You don't, you don't have to have a Google, you don't have to have anything. You just show up. So then I had just shifted to, um, YouTube and it, you know, I, I, I do a thing every month, but then, you know, oh, we come over here in quarantine. And at the beginning, I didn't have any of my stuff because, uh, <laughs> when I moved, when I, when I came up here, um, we knew that we had to leave our place in Brooklyn because when my husband was sent home, we live in an 850 square foot apartment with just my office, just my studio. So there, there wouldn't be no place for him to work. So we came up here to the weekend house and all I had was the, the folding table that we used for Thanksgiving, folding table, folding chair. That's it. So then little by little, I'm like, oh, okay. I'm doing a lot of stuff. I'll, I'll bring one light. I'll bring that. I'll bring that the key light. Okay. Well, you know what? I'll, it's too dark. I'll bring the fill light. Okay. Yeah. I'm bring my side ring light, but I, that's it. Well, the front tripod actually, you know what? The overhead boom would be handy. <laughs> so, like little by little, it all starts coming in. So the original quarantine live for those, uh, anyone out there actually attend the very first quarantine live. Cause it was a hot mess. Ah, oh, Corey, it was me. <laughs> I, I like literally turned on a camera and just was like, hi, you want to keep me company for an hour? Like, remember Corey, there was no, we didn't have an agenda. I just like talked about my week, you know, so I, sometimes there was some tears, uh, the craziest one though was January 6th. Were you on live while live. things were going down? Live. I have so to confess, I, I was not watching you. I was watching the news. So the the wackadoo thing was um it was Mother of Pearl was on. And I thought, oh good, you know what? It'll be fun to be distracted from the count for, an, for you know, not the count from the, you know, the register, the, the, you know, where there were registering the, del the delegates um, because there's going to be annoying speeches. And then, I, so I said in the YouTube live, like, okay, no political chatter. I don't want to hear it. Like, let's just talk knitting. So people started putting in the chat, like, oh my God, are you seeing this? I'm like, no, 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 no. We're mm. We said no. So I finish the, the live and I come downstairs. Capital had been breached. It all happened. And I was supposed to teach live that night. Um, I was teaching uh, 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 Build a Better Fabric for Factor Knitting. And people were so sweet. I had 50 people and that, that class was sold out with a wait list. It always sells out with a wait list. And I emailed um, all 50 people. And I said, I cannot teach tonight. I cannot concentrate on teaching tonight. Can we change it to next week? And every single person was like, oh, I'm so glad you said that. I can't either. I, you know, so yeah. So that was that was the the craziest. But originally it was just me chatting. And then I got sick of the sound of my own voice and I started inviting friends to hang out with me. And it was really just like I, I read uh, uh, something that someone wrote on Ravelry expecting like a formal podcast. Um, and they said they couldn't, they, it, it was me and Carson and they wrote like, I couldn't even watch it. It was too much chatter. It's too much chit chat. It was not <laughs> enough content. And I'm like, yeah, cause it's me and my friends hanging out and you all are hanging out with us and we're just <laughs> chatting. This isn't like, I do not have a formal interview. So yeah, then it was, it was that. And then I had to go to once a month because I, I could, I had work yeah. I had to do. And yeah, then it, every it, once in a while, like. I take a month off. Like I took a month off because I'm, I'm with you because I normally do it on a Wednesday and I'm like, oh, I'll just do the Amy thing and then I'll I'll do it next week. I mean, next month. So I'm doing it with December with um, Gudrun is coming to hang with me next next awesome. month. So. Awesome. I, well, gosh, thanks. I'm so glad that you're here with me. Sure. <laughs> okay, so I cannot not bring up the Seth Meyers thing. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> But so for the folks that are not up to speed on the whole Seth Meyers thing. Is there anyone that is? How did that get started? So first of all, I didn't start it. It wasn't me. 
So, um, and I, and I, I, now I'm forgetting her name, but I wrote down her name in the Modern Daily Knitting column because she's one of my followers on Facebook and she commented on Facebook, that was me. So I love, I well, I true confession. I came to love Seth Meyer during COVID. I actually never watched the show before. So I'm not a late night person. And all I had ever seen of Seth Meyers is when um, my brother's like a huge fan of this, this bit jokes Seth can't tell, which are his two female writers who make him, uh, it all came out because like in the, in the writer's room, sometimes they would tell a joke and Seth would be like, I can't tell that joke. Like you could tell it, right? So um, Amber, Amber Ruffin, who now has her own show, who I'm obsessed with. So I had seen a couple of those. I'd seen a couple of closer look, but that's it. I never watched the show. When COVID hit and everyone was sent home, because like you said, I pivoted quickly because I didn't pivot. I do this all the time. Friends of mine would say like, oh, you should see, um, you know, so-and-so, his lighting is so terrible. You should give him a tip or you should see, you know, like Colbert was in his garage. <laughs> And Seth Meyer was originally like in the hallway of his downstairs. Terrible lighting, terrible sound. So people were like, oh, you should see this is terrible. So I started watching and um, I, there was, there's something so intimate about this guy in his, you know, in a regular shirt, not in a suit, um, being a hot mess, just a hot mess. Um, so we started watching it all the time. And, and the first time, um, we were trying to find something on YouTube. I couldn't remember. I like blanked on his name for a second. Cause like all, you know, all those white men, they all look alike. I can't tell the difference. And I said, Oh, the, the, the little man in the attic, he's funny. Cause he was doing his show from the attic. So then I just, we just started calling him the little man in the attic and then became the little man. So we watched him all the time. And one of our favorite, favorite weekly segments that started in March was called Corrections. So Corrections evolved from people <laughs> correcting him, sending in corrections of things that he did wrong. And what's funny is that people, a lot of people in Ravelry thought I was really angry with him or thought he was really angry with us. But, you know, he calls us the jackals. <laughs> That's what we're called, the ones that are always correcting him. Um, but, you know, he loves us. Like, it's a very loving, affectionate thing. So he, he had done this whole knitting bit, which, of course, like every knitting bit was filled with mistakes. <laughs> and another knitter, not me, mm -hmm. sent in a correction. And he did his famous bit where he said, I'm going to read the correction. I'm not going to read the last line. I, 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 or I'm going to save the, uh, the first line. This is the first line. So he read the correction like, this is clearly uh, not a Afghan, it's a soccer sweater. This is clearly not this, it's this, you know, slop, sloppy, sloppy work. And then he said, but she started with, are you effing kidding me? He didn't say effing. And he's like, well, that certainly broke my stereotype of knitting. You know, I think of knitters just like quietly knitting, watching corrections. What the F? So I, I clipped the, I clipped the show and I, I shared it on Instagram and, you know, I have a certain number of people who follow me. And so I clipped it and I said, Seth Meyers clearly doesn't know, you know, effing about knitters. And of course it went, it went crazy viral. And um, so then the first show, <clears throat> he didn't name me. He didn't mention me by name. He just said, uh, uh, apparently a, a lovely woman, a very popular a member of the knitting community, apparently clipped the show and started this. So that was the first thing. And then, uh, and then I was trying to find, I was Googling to get the clip. And I Googled Seth Meyers and knitting. And what came up was a magazine cover that he did years ago for GQ 
that showed him with a crocheted blanket <laughs> with two knitting needles stuck in it straight down. So then I, that, then I had to get on in that. So then I did a whole Instagram story about that. And so then again, he said, I heard from that lady again, same lovely, same lovely woman. So then he, you know, did that. And um, yeah, so that just escalated. He, he lost the Emmy. So then I sent him a sweater and then I sent him a hat. It was the whole thing. But anyway, it was just, I just love him. I, it, I, I feel very warmly towards him because I feel like he kept me sane during COVID. Is, is it over or do you think you're going to teach him to knit one day? No, no, <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's over. <clears throat> if someday I meet him, um, it would, I would be charmed, but no, it was just, it was a, it was a, a, a moment, a moment between us. He did like the hat though. It, it, it's been very, very entertaining to watch the whole <laughs> thing play out. Absolutely. So Patty, what's next for you? What do you have going on? Well, I ha after I turn in the book, I have to turn my attention to, a to affinity. So I, that's, that's my next big planning. So I, I don't think I'll be able to open registration quite as early as I did last year. Cause last year I opened it in February. I mean, not last year, you know, 2019 for 2020. Um, so that'll be the next big thing that I really have to turn my attention to, to firm up all the teachers and the vendors. And I have some plans that I'm cooking up um, for an extension day this year, I'm hoping for the retreat involving maybe some fun stuff like uh, to go and do a boat ride and the, the, there's this wonderful old recreation center with candle pin bowling and pinball and no one had time ever to go there. So anyway, I'm going to start working on that. And then, um, and then I hit the road again. So in, in February, I'm, you know, I've got to get back out there with the gigs that I have booked. And then it will be a, still a lot of book work because there's a ton of work to do between manuscript and publication. So there'll be a lot of that. And um, I'm thinking, I don't want to commit, but I, normally I do two sweater, video sweater classes every year, but I think I will not do another sweater until the fall, but it, instead, because I'm like all in my brioche head, I think I'm going to launch a series of um, brioche accessory uh, video classes for the spring. So I have, I have the hat, I have a syncopated brioche scarf that's really fun. I'm going to do one more project. And so that might be in my spring mid along. Because nice. it's been a while since I've done accessory. I did Labadee Cowl, but that was ages ago. Mostly I'm sweater. So I think what's the timing of your spring knit along usually? Uh, I have no idea when it's going to launch. I, I, everything's crazy because of the book. I mean, normally I have all this stuff, you know, I have it all charted out and I know when the on sale date is and when the cast on it, but everything's a little like, um, I do not feel very multitasky right now. I'm actually really impressed that you said that there's a lot to do with the book between, you know, manuscript, between sending it in and, oh my God, so much. It. but it seems like someone who's writing their first book might not be prepared for that. So clearly you've gotten good intel. Well, I just know, I mean, I know what publishing is. I know there'll be then things go into layout and then there's first pages. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of work with the illustrator. Um, there's a lot, it's, you know, it's over 300 illustrations. So it's a lot. <laughs> do they make you do them? No, <laughs> no, no. I've hired a, a wonderful illustrator that does, um, has done like every big knitting book you can think of. So I, I feel I feel in very good hands because I don't what I hate is we've all seen those knitting illustrations where you're like, nah, knitter didn't draw this. Like, you know, <laughs> this was drawn from a photograph by a non knitter. So like there's no running thread between the stitches or like, a you know, eh, you know, can't have that. You guys deserve better than that. All of you lovely people. <laughs> and Natalie gave me a thumbs up. So I would love to invite questions from everybody here in the audience. If you've got some questions that you want to throw in the chat, I think we might convince Patty to answer some of them. 
Well, some I saw already. Let's see. There were a couple, and I think you answered the ones. Oh, Pamela said, uh, you're wearing what I, I, I think of as my sweater. It's my sweater. You've got to knit your own. Hi from Los Angeles. You know, talking about that sweater, the, the blue one in the background, I'm really interested in that combination of, you said it's it's cotton. Yeah. It's silk and yeah. not so the, you know how there's always rules like, oh, you should never do brioche and cotton, right? That's a rule. So um, oh, do I have anything plugged in? I don't know if this is plugged into anything. Hold on. I don't think this is plugged in, but I'm going to see. Um, do you remember by any chance uh, classical elite silk? I do you remember that? Yeah. No. So this is, you know, a, a little known. No, I don't have this camera plugged in. A little known fact in the knitting world, because, um, you know, I used to work for a yarn company, too, is there's only so many mills in the world. So often when you look at two different yarns from two different yarn companies and you're like, wow, they're so similar. Yeah, they are. They're from the same mill. So classically, which was a company that I loved when it um, when it went out of business, um, you know, the mills that made some of their yarn, you'll still find yarns pop up. Like someone just asked me for a yarn substitution for um, Chateau, which is a yarn that I, I did, uh, I used for a, a pattern called Walker. And I was looking around and I saw a Plymouth yarn. I'm like, that Chateau, mm. <laughs> that Chateau. So this yarn um, is, I'm gonna to try to hold it up. It's so nubby. Can you see like the texture of it? Yeah. So unlike, you know, kind of a, a smooth cotton that would be inappropriate for brioche, this is br brilliant for brioche. Let's see if I have one of the, because it is toothy. Um, yeah, this is in the, this is in it. Um, it's like toothy and grippy and yummy. And it just, um, yeah, it's a really great blend, but it, but because of the little bit of nylon content, it holds its shape. So that's, what's so important that 20% nylon is going to give you that stability. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't become a grower, but the 30% silk makes it soft like butter. What's the name of the yard again? Holly. This is Valley Holly. Yes. It is delish. Yeah. Um, I love your gauge watch cast on. Did you make that up? No, I did not make that up. Um, where did I first learn it? Um, 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 I learned it when I was running a yarn store. Oh, I remember uh, who, who taught it to me. Um, uh, June Havis Hyatt taught it to me. That's where I learned it. Um, I was... Uh, she was coming in to teach and um, she was teaching a cast on and bind off class. And um, I mean, I do, I, I will say I simplified the instructions a lot because it was very hard for, for knitters to, to, to get that one. But so I might've tweaked it a little bit and changed a little bit, but the core, the heart of it came from, from her. I'm trying to make my own. Pamela says, I'm trying to make my own, but that one fits me so well. I think she's talking ah, about your sweater. My, yes, your sweater. You're not taking it, but you can make your own. Um, so there. And Ellie wants to know your process for designing a pattern. I, well, I mean, I always feel like I'm disappointing people when I say this. Uh, I used to, I used to, I know you had Josh, uh, you had Josh on a, a, a while ago and um, Josh and I used to always be on panel discussions for, for Vogue and questions like this would come up. There'd be like a panel of designers and someone would ask like, you know, what's your process or like, what, what are your goals as a designer? What, what, what do you think is the most special about you? And I would always feel like I disappoint people because these designers would come up with very lofty, you know, so I generally design what I want to wear. <laughs> so like 
Saucony's cardigan, by the way, which I have been living in, I wear it every single day. I, I literally just designed a sweater that I absolutely wanted to wear. I needed a, the pockets to be deep enough to stick things in. And, and, you know, like this, I love, I love a, a big neck, but I hate the itchiness. Um, I wanted to do a, a touch of brioche without doing it all over brioche sweater. So a lot of times it's just what I want to wear. And then what I think would be interesting to knit. So it's a combination of product and process because uh, I remember I was, I did this um, long cabled cardigan for Vogue uh, ages ago. And um, I, I, <laughs> it was long and I thought, oh, I don't want to pick up stitches for the button band. And I know if I don't want to do it, y'all don't want to do it. So then I had to figure out a way to do an incorporated button band. But then it was like a challenge because the cables change needle sizes. That was part of the shaping. So then I was like, hmm, how do I do an incorporated button band? With, you know, so then I ended up doing it on DPNs with short rows. And that was really fun. So that's, I mean, that's my process is what do I want to wear and what do I want to knit? I always felt like I disappointed people when on the panel, they would often ask like, what are you most proud of as a designer? And this was back when I was, I was doing a lot of magazine work. Now I mostly publish, uh, self-publish, but back then I was working for seven different magazines at one time. So I said, what am I most proud of is I, I, um, I never miss a deadline and there's no math errors in my patterns. So there. So Aaron wants to know when you're coming back to Houston. Um, I'm doing the, I, I mean, maybe I shouldn't, I, I, I'm supposed to do, you know, I was going to do the Houston Fiber Festival and obviously that got canceled. So um, we're, I, I, I think we're going to do it. I mean, I, I think we're doing it again, if all goes well this summer. So keep your eyes out. And Wynn wants to know if you're still wearing soccer tort. Oh, I love soccer tort. Yeah. That one's sort of like a, um, I, I wear it more like a coat because it's, it's, uh, it's a great fall outer garment. Um, but yeah, I love soccer tote. Yeah. And Ellie, uh, uh, sorry. Um, Wynn said that, uh, that cable Cardi is still the top of her queue. And I agree Wynn, that's a fantastic piece. Oh, well, you're probably I, talking about the, thank you. You're probably um, talking about the, cable Cardi. the, that's a different one. You're yeah. probably talking about the the um, <clears throat> uh, the maker feature, the sort of very complex cable, like lots of cables, and it swings out. Um, the The other cable cardigan I did years ago for them is is just uh, it's it's lovely, but it's not it's not the it's probably not the one you're thinking of. It's um like a nesting honeycomb thing. It's in a soft alpaca. <laughs> Um, I guess one of them, <laughs> thank you for the folks that um, have complimented the cowl behind me. Um, this is, um, this is not released yet. This is, this is called Patishu and it's going to be coming out super, sh very, 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 very soon. So keep an eye. Um, but thank you. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you. The shawl is, um, the shawl is, I'm blanking. I don't know. I, it's the one I published over the summer. It's, uh, this is Lorelei's Looking Glass. It's the problem coming up with names of things looking class or glass looking glass like what? a mirror oh who's lorelei lorelei is um a, a mermaid she's a german mermaid that lives in the oh. rhine and i was trying to do sort of sunlight rippling on water and the reflections of sunlight on water so i was kind of there's a rock that supposedly merm this this mermaid lorelei sits on in the rhine and you know lures sailors to their death it's because it's just a, a very rocky portion of the Rhine, but you know, the legend is very pretty. And so, yes. So it was the, her looking glass of course would be the water. Oh, nice. Yeah. Naming things is the worst. Yeah, it's very, very, it, yes. Very complex story behind that. <laughs> I, I usually name things after a location. I'll like open a map and be like, oh, okay. This one was easy because it was, you know, Audrey Hepburn inspired. So um, there was already, uh, what was the other Audrey Hepburn movie that everyone was doing? Um, 
ah, oh, uh, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, you always have to check it on Ravelry. So there was already an Audrey, there was already a Sabrina, but no one did charade, which is one of my favorite movies where she does wear the big white collar um, is the, the one with Cary Grant where they're tracking, trying to track down the, the postage stamp. Oh, it's really good. I'm always amazed when there's a one word pattern name or one word, anything that, that isn't already used I, because yeah. I, you know, there's so many patterns out there and to try to find a name that hasn't been used already is. I know. I couldn't believe no one had used Volition because Volition was my favorite pattern name because the whole thing with Volition is, um, you know, you started with a provisional cast on back here and then you worked up and then you worked down and then you worked this way and we're all these different directions. But by the time you got to the join, you could decide whether or not you were doing cardigan or pullover. And there were three different stitch patterns. So it was, you know, it's like your choice, your volition. So I, for that one, I knew I wanted something choice related. And so I used, uh, you know, the online thesaurus. And I saw Volition. I was like, oh, that's such a good name. I'm sure it's taken. And it wasn't. Oh, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, everyone's been really sweet in the comments in the chat. We have a couple more minutes if anybody has any other questions. And um, so you called this, I'm looking at this, this detail, the neck you have on this, the version of charade that you're wearing. You called that a wide turtleneck. Is that okay? So it is. I was curious as to whether that folded over. Yeah. So yeah. so I had to um, I had to unvent the way to reverse the braided cast on that I created for this one mm -hmm. because there the cast on sits. I mean the the bind off sits where you see it, mm -hmm. but then I had to figure out how to reverse it for this, and of course you reverse the color pickup too. Yeah. And we've got a question in there from Natalie, who's starting a pair of lined mittens tonight, and she needs to start with a provisional cast on and wants to know your recommendation. Okay, so this is really important because um, it's really important that you know uh, what the designer used because it's an important distinction for stitch count. So if the designer uses a provisional cast on that has the same number of stitches going each way, because there's only one provisional cast on that does that, um, then my favorite is the provisional cast on based off of Judy's magic cast on. So you do Judy's magic cast on, then you have stitches on this needle, stitches on this needle, you knit one side and the others just hang there. But really important, if you substitute Judy's magic cast on provisional for a different provisional and the pattern is written, assuming you are going to lose one stitch, a half a stitch on either side, um, it's not that you can't do it, but you might need to start with the knit two together, you know, if you're going back the other direction. But the other one I like is crochet cast on over the needle, not doing a chain and then picking up into it because my chain's not good enough. I, I, my chain's often too tight. I really have trouble with, you know, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a good crocheter. So I really have trouble making a crochet chain that's like wants to be worked into. So instead you do the crochet cast on, but over the needle. And I like that one. So Patty, I'm, I'm curious. Cause I, 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 I agree. I love doing the crochet cast on over the knitting needle because um the, for a couple of times I tried chaining and then knitting into the back loop, I wasn't consistent enough and it wouldn't end. Yeah. I just, I was, you know, it wasn't for me. I wasn't good at it. It's harder for knitters. I mean, I remember having, I remember having a crocheter. I had my crochet hook and um, I was treating it like a knitting needle. And I, the best tip that I ever had um, any knitter, tell, any crocheter tell me is I'm so used to sizing a stitch to my needle, right? So when I was doing a chain, I wish I had plugged in my overhead, but I didn't. I had it boom, like tight, tight, tight to my hook, right? So then I would try to do a chain and I'd be like, mine's broken. Go through. Does Mine not won't go through. And she explained like, yeah, we don't, we don't strangle the hook like that. You, you leave air. So you don't 
you don't you don't strangle that you leave air and i am much better at it now i mean i did i i had a whole unvented cast on that uses a crochet hook for for this thing um for see i had these are all my these are all the 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 cast ons that i rejected this was a two color braided cast on but it was too tight i didn't like it so then i unvented this one that's like if you married it's like the cable cast on marries the crochet cast on marries the chinese waitress cast on and had a baby <laughs> but um yeah it's much easier when you go over the needle it's hard to it's hard to play with a hook when you're when you're not you know a crocheter it's a good way of putting it <laughs> <laughs> patty Thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. Oh, you're so welcome. It was so nice to hang with you guys. I'm going to sc scroll through all the little faces one last time. All these, oh, everyone's so excited. So many people loving. Oh, Judy's here, <laughs> Diane's here. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I've put lots Olive. of- Sorry. Oh, go ahead, go, go. I just saw Olive McNeil. Olive, your camera's not on, but I see you. I see you, Olive. <laughs> I put hi Patty. How are hi. you? Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna be good. See, this is what happens. We're we we we're alone so much. I see people's names. We're like, oh my god. Sorry. Uh, there's lots of lots lots of links in the chat. Uh, all kinds of links to Patty's website, her video pl platform for teaching, her social media, my website, my social media. Oh. Um, I am on here once a month doing this video podcast, Wouldn't It Be Fun? And I am setting up somebody fantastic for you for next month. I can't tell you who yet, but if you follow me, I'm Devious Knitter on Instagram or follow the podcast, Wouldn't It Be Fun? You can find out who's gonna be on here next month.